let's talk about some ways that language is spread. So we've talked a little bit about an introduction to world Englishes. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about how a language spreads from one place in the world to another. Okay, there are lots of different ways that can cause languages to spread or expand, um, but we're going to talk about the main ways here. So first of all, you need to know some things. Uh, Karen has a magical world, um, and yes, I do talk about myself in the third person. So Karen has a magical kingdom where all languages are valuable, meaning that there is not one language that's better or more important than another. Um, also, multilingualism is highly encouraged. So when people encounter a new language, they don't substitute it out for their language, they just add it to their list of languages that they speak. Okay. All varieties are equal, meaning that even things within a language, um, it doesn't matter what the dialect is, all of those dialects are equal and equally good. Um, and differences are interesting. So I don't talk about things as being good or bad in one language to another, although my um, my own personal biases may come into play and sometimes I have a reaction when I hear something or hear a particular dialect, uh, but when I logically think about it, um, I really don't have a preference for one thing over another. Okay? So differences are interesting and spread doesn't mean replacement. Again, back to the idea that it's okay for us to add more languages to our language repertoire. Okay. Crystal is quoted as saying, the history of a global language can be traced through the successful expeditions of its soldier or sailor speakers, and English has been no exception. So what he means by that is that when someone has a lot of economic power, or a lot of military power, or socio-political power, then those languages tend to be languages that spread um, along with its speakers as they go about the globe. And that is something that we've seen time and time again. Uh, the main two ways that a language spreads and becomes a world language uh, through exploration or colonization. When we're talking about exploration, it's usually a temporary arrangement. It might be through trade or other things. Uh, when we're talking about colonization, it's a more permanent arrangement, um, often at the expense of the local uh, customs, language, um, and peoples. They often don't get a say in what it is that happens during colonization. Um, there are two different things that happen through these processes. The first is called pigeonization. And I'm going to talk about what it is to become a pigeon a little bit more in the next lecture. Um, but pigeonization is where we have two languages coming into contact, where the speakers don't understand one another, and they start to make up a language that's somewhere in between the two languages. It mostly has the vocabulary of the higher power language, um, but it's only used for a short term for communication. Then we have the process of stabilization, which is where that pidgin has been, existed for a long time, and it starts to become a language that people use over and over again, um, and even children start to learn it. Once the language becomes stabilized, then it leads to some sort of standardization and often to one standard over another. Okay. After those factors have happened, we see some things currently um, that we would call agencies of spread, or these are organizations that also help to spread certain dialects across the globe. So one of the reasons this happens is that when we learn a language, we also learn about people's culture and their values. So most countries have a high degree of interest in trying to spread what they view as being positive values across the globe. Okay. So some agencies of spread that exist right now, uh, the British Council uh, sends people or sends um, information and lots of uh, books and on how to teach English and different uh, information that teachers can use across the globe. Um, they also sometimes send people to help teachers as well. So wherever the British Council is present, um, then you have a number of speakers who are learning British English as their dialect of choice, uh, often because they've been provided with these materials. Again, with the idea that if we provide them with materials about our type of English, that we're also giving them some good, good positive information about ourselves. Okay, um, the United States is no exception to this. We have many programs that are used to help spread American English and American values. Uh, we have IIE, uh, which is the American um, Education, International Education Exchange. 
it, it umbrellas programs like Fulbright, where we send people um, or bring people to the United States from other countries. Um, and it, under the Fulbright umbrella, we have a number of people who go to other countries as English teaching assistants. We also have an entity called American English um, that has materials they produce. They have a website and a blog and a Facebook page and things where they try to help teachers who are teaching all over the globe uh, with their needs and help them uh, understand some ways of how we might do teaching methodology here. Um, and all of these things, again, are, are with the goal in mind that we're not only um, giving them the English, but that we're also forming connections. It's a type of diplomacy um, that's used as well. So I have participated uh, under the U.S. State Department as what's called an English language specialist, where I have traveled to other countries to help um, teachers learn how to better uh, implement teaching strategies for English. My most recent assignment uh, was in the fall of 2016. I was in Indonesia for a month. And in Indonesia, I mostly worked on what's called content-based instruction, where you teach English and content. Um, but I was working primarily in uh, Islamic schools, and schools where they're working on trying to make English the language of instruction in their universities, uh, but they're also teaching Islamic studies because it's a religious institution, a private religious institution. And so they're working on how could we teach Islamic studies in English instead of in Indonesian or in the traditional Arabic um, as a way to increase their English abilities. Um, so the United States has a large interest in trying to develop relationships with countries um, that are becoming economic powers. And that's one way we develop diplomatic relations with a country is to offer to bring in people to help with their English instruction. Okay. Um, so our book talks about some models of English. The goal of a model is to characterize the different types of Englishes that exist in the world in one set. Okay. Our brains like to organize things. It's not that we really have to put them all together, um, but there are some reasons why we want to see them all together so that as we're talking about them, we can understand what the differences are and what the similarities are. Okay. So our brains like to organize things. And then as we proceed to our other types of goals, like trying to help with English instruction, it's important for us to understand that the needs of the different groups are very different, um, whether someone is learning in an ESL setting or an EFL setting changes the way we do instruction a little bit. Okay, so here's the model that I uh, most prefer, which is the circle model. Um, you probably have already guessed that from the way our course is set up. You can see at the bottom the inner circle has what I would think of as, as kind of the oldest Englishes. Um, however, some of those vary quite a bit in age as well. So British English, of course, was the first. And as, um, as English started to spread to other places, all of these that are listed in the inner circle, I would say that English is the primary language that's spoken from the majority of the people in those countries. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's everyone's first language, but a majority of the people learn it as their first language. Um, as we move up to the outer circle, uh, we have places where English may be in existence with other languages. Uh, we call this a diglossic situation, uh, where we have multiple languages that might be used for different tasks. Okay? And um, English has been around a little bit longer in some of those places. And then as we go up to the expanding circle, those are some of the places where English is a little bit newer. But if you look at the number of speakers, um, being in the inner circle doesn't necessarily mean that you have more speakers than some of those outer circles. Um, in fact, today we have far more non-native speakers of English or second language learners of English than we do native speakers of English. So um, the idea that the native speaker is the model is kind of interesting where most people exist in a place where there are not uh, native speakers that sound like me, right? The, native, the idea of what a native speaker of English looks like is changing as English expands throughout the world. 
So in our book, um, there's a little quote, or not a quote, but some information that's presented by Schneider about how language spreads. He proposes five different phases um, about how language spreads. The first phase is foundation, where you have contact with the language and maybe a few indigenous people become interpreters. So in this case where I'm using the word indigenous, I mean the people who were there who spoke their own language before, in this case, English ever showed up. Okay. If we look at a country like India, and we think about before British colonization, there are many languages that were and are spoken in India today. Okay. And when the British came in as colonizers, um, and they first started to make contact with the people who lived in India, uh, nobody there really spoke English, right? It was traders and merchants who were coming in to exchange goods, and people in India were anxious to communicate with them and to, um, and to do business with them, especially when they bring in things uh, that seem very exciting from, from Great Britain that people in India have not seen before. And so the local people are highly motivated to start communicating, um, not knowing exactly what that's going to lead to, but at this stage just thinking about it as a communication for trade and exchange of money and, and goods. Okay. Um, so a few people in India start to become uh, proficient in English so that they can communicate. At first we have a mix of languages where most of the vocabulary is English, but some of the structure might be from the native languages that are there. But over time, um, we start to have people become proficient and they start to act as interpreters. Okay, as we move into phase two, the exonormative stabilization, um, we now have a stable dialect of some type of English that's there in India and some bilingualism starts to emerge. So we see people who are very proficient in both the language that they learn from their mother at home and maybe they have been learning English from a very young age as well. Um, maybe they have been working in a home, maybe they have intermarried and so one parent speaks English and one parent speaks another language. We start to see the dialect of English that's spoken there start to stabilize. Phase, phase three is a nativization, where English adapts to, um, English as the language, adapts to the local socio-political and cultural practices. So we now start to see vocabulary show up in English that explains uh, local customs and things that they do there, and people start to use it as more of a native language. Um, or maybe they use it um, in addition to another sort of indigenous language that was there. In phase four, the endonormative stabilization, uh, the English starts to separate, separate from the colonizer itself. So in stage three, even though we have a lot of people who have learned English as like a native language, the reason they've done that is because of the colonizer that's there. So there's some sort of economic advantage to be learning that. As we get into phase four, it starts to it starts to separate from the colonizer or what the identity is of the people who are there colonizing uh, the area. And the English starts to take on its own um, culture and norms. Okay? And then we get to phase five, uh, where it's no longer viewed as part of the colonizer. So when we hear Indian English today, we don't think, oh, yeah, that is, you know, these, this many steps away from British English. We think of it now as its own entity. And certainly speakers of that language in India who learn English natively, they don't think of themselves as being somehow part British. Instead, they are thinking of themselves as being Indian English speakers. And of course, I mean if their parents aren't actually British. Um, but if their parents are from India, then they no longer share that identity uh, with Great Britain. They now are seeing themselves as a separate and distinct uh, language and culture. Okay. So the things, uh, um, the things that are important for us to remember about the English language complex, uh, which is a phrase that Kirkpatrick uses to explain it all, or I'm sorry, that Meshri and and bot used to explain it all, is that the spread of English is very complicated, okay? and different situations have different issues. So as English spreads across the globe, there are some different issues that arise. Um, there are different socio-political contexts, and we start to have these two questions emerge where we wonder, what does it mean to be a native speaker? Okay? Most people, when they think of a native speaker of English, think of someone who sounds like me. 
Um, but in fact, there are lots of different dialects where people are native speakers of that language. It may be the only language they've learned from birth, uh, but we may not think of them as native speakers. Why is that when they truly meet the definition of a native speaker? And then as we talk about what is a native variety of English, um, what does that mean? Okay. Lots of uh, jobs in China only hire native speakers to teach English. And so uh, what they mean is if you come from the UK or from the United States, um, and they expect that you are going to sound a certain way, maybe not Southern English, maybe not New York English, um, maybe they are accepting of Australian English now, but they certainly don't mean native speakers who come from Singapore who look the same ethnically as the other Chinese speakers in the class. So we start to have some uh, feelings outside of the linguistic properties of the language about what it means to be a native speaker and what it means to have a native language of English.